The first time I saw her, she was wearing green. Well, mostly green. Green crop trousers, green sweater. I can't say that I remember anything else. Shoes, that sort of thing. I was wearing a beige linen jacket, sweatshirt and jeans. Normally, I wouldn't remember what I was wearing yesterday, let alone that long ago. But I do remember my wife saying something like, You're not wearing that, are you? Just as I was about to go out of the door, that referred to the jacket, one that she had never liked, and that I seldom got away with if we were going out together. God knows why she didn't like it. Probably because it predated her. She did have this tendency to turn against anything she hadn't had a part in choosing, like clothes, old friends of either gender, or indeed anything that she hadn't pre-approved. <laughs> you note that I speak of her in the past tense. This is because she no longer exists. As my wife, that is. On the contrary, she does indeed exist, <laughs> and does so quite stridently, as I note my cost, cost being the operative word. It will be impossible for me to forget her existence, because she's constantly in touch not only with me, but my bank, my solicitor, or indeed anything that might have to do with my income. As a result, my financial position is not quite as strong as it might be. We made all the usual arrangements, of course, as one does, but she has developed an uncanny knack of finding holes in these arrangements. This as I have discovered from my friends, is not unusual. Hmm. Their experience of the process of legal separation has been weirdly similar, so much so that, when we do have a night out together, less frequently now, I might add, we find ourselves spending a disproportionate amount of our drinking money on travelling to distant parts where we are unlikely to be spotted by our respective exes there to be punched upon and subjected to even more unreasonable demands. Anyway, all this is in the past. As I said, the first time I clapped eyes on her, no, not my wife, her, she was wearing green and coming out of Selfridges. I have to say, I did look twice. Probably why I noticed the colours. Usually that sort of thing goes straight over my head, so something must have made an impression. Not easy to pin it down, though. Right height, right build, right age, right, right everything, I suppose. Nothing that specific, nothing apart from the clothes, that is, that really struck me. But something must have done, because that first sighting can't have lasted more than a few seconds before we were both swallowed up in the Oxford Street rush. Whatever, the vision stayed with me on and off for the next couple of days, enough for me to register instantly when next we met. Met? Well, no. No, we didn't actually meet as such just like the first time. It was more like a sighting, you know, like a twitcher. Suddenly, there she was flashing across my sight lines, and then she was gone. And once again, it was the green, the colour. No more than that, just an impression of, well, green. And before we go any further, I should probably get one thing straight. I mean, I am not one of those odd sorts of individuals that gets turned on by something as ordinary as colour. In fact, to carry the twitcher metaphor... It was not unlike spotting a kingfisher. Well, at least that's what I imagine, because I've never, in reality, seen a kingfisher in the feather, so to speak, but I have seen that small ornithologist guy on television, and I remember how he described them. They're so quick that all you get is an impression of blue, and that was precisely like the first two occasions that I saw her, just a flash, an impression of green. Again, it was outside Selfridges, which is not so surprising. <laughs> I mean, lots of people shop at Selfridges, and I work just round the corner. As on the previous occasion, she was leaving the store while I was walking past on my way to Soho for some lunch. We were walking in opposite directions, and as usual, the pavements were packed, and by the time I'd registered her and turned round, she'd gone. I suppose I could have followed her, but that time I wasn't that bothered. I mean, she was just another girl. And I still couldn't come up with a reasonable explanation why, among all those thousands of people rushing about, I should be fixated on her, which I, which I wasn't. I mean, my predilections are more boring rather than weird, and I'm certainly not one of those stalking sort of people anyway. I was a married man, and convinced myself on a daily basis almost that the marriage was likely to be as good as it ever got. I mean, it was obviously past the honeymoon stage, perpetually randy stage, but... 
nothing outstandingly ghastly in the arrangement, and yet here I was beginning, only beginning, mind you, to think about some girl whom I'd only glimpsed twice. Time went by, work taking up most of it, until one day Maeve, my wife, uh, her name is really Mavis, so she avoided quite a lot of unkind comments by adopting the Irish version, suggested we take in a show in the West End. After she finished work in Rickmansworth, where she worked and we lived at the time, why didn't she come up to Euston, where I could meet her and we could have dinner somewhere before the theatre? Well, this in itself was quite an unusual thing, because, to be honest, we spent very little time in each other's company. She had her own interest, badminton, the amateur operatic scene, and gossiping with her friends. Well, I favour pursuits involving male company, down at the pub, and discussions on dynamic global issues, and rugby, and all that sort of stuff. However, since I generally agree to most things that Maeve suggests, I find it easier in the long run, I said yes. As her train wasn't due in for a while, I decided to walk from Orchard Street, where I worked. This, I considered, might be the most promising part of the proposed evening's entertainment. Our theatrical taste didn't really match, and my initial response to her choice of venue, which, to be fair, she had booked and paid for, was a touch lukewarm. You see, she tended towards the loud, musical sort of stuff, with dancers banging about on the stage and over singers bellowing away to the detriment of everyone's eardrums, whereas I, I was more for, um, hmm, it was difficult to say, really. Uh, truth is, none of it really is my scene. I'll watch a good play on television, but all this business of having to pay to leave your coat with someone and spending two hours wedged up against some overweight, flatulent student does leave a little be desired. Well, at least in my mind it does. My other problem with the theatre is always wanting to go to the toilet. When, stuck in the middle of row F, and the performance is just reaching its dramatic climax. Theatre glowers are not, in my experience, the friendliest people in the world. It is through talking of toilets, though, which brings me to my third encounter with the anonymous woman in green. Having on Mavis's, this is not up for debate, advice, I had limited my beer intake before the performance, thereby sparing the embarrassment referred to above. So I managed to hold out until the interval when we both retired to our respective loos, from which I emerged a few moments later, secure in the knowledge that I would be hanging about for ages, because Maeve... Well, God knows what she does in there, but whatever it is, it takes her about five times as long to get to it as it does me. Anyway, I re-entered the foyer, and there she was. No, 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 not Maeve. Her, standing about ten feet away, reading her programme. No green this time. Oh, except for a silk scarf, but looking quite elegant in a sort of beige, sooty thing, and my mid-thirties, perhaps? About my age, nice figure, from what I could judge, quite pretty. I tried to commit these components to memory, much better than a momentary flash of green, which is, as fantasies go, leaves a lot to be desired. She seemed intent on her programme, so she must be finding the evening quite interesting, and, without being too obvious, tongue hanging out, that sort of thing, she seemed oblivious of my observation. Now, that is unusual, because if you stare at someone, they become conscious of the fact, but she didn't. That is, until she heard a distinctly accusatory voice. Do you know that woman? Oh, dear. Maeve. Quite loud and suitably venomous. At that, the woman looked up, I looked guilty, and the rest of the audience looked quite interested, possibly wondering if the evening's entertainment might be taking a turn for the better. What? No, no, of course not, came my muttered and confused repost, followed by a floated sorry to the woman, which I cunningly accompanied with a sorrowful shake of the head to indicate that Maeve was a victim of either dementia or galloping PMT. This didn't seem to improve Maeve's humour very much, because she grabbed my arm quite fiercely, hissed the word bastard 
again too loudly for my personal comfort, and steered me back into the auditorium. Not before, however, I caught a glimpse of laughter in the woman's eyes as she tucked her programme back into her bag. It could be said that our evening was not an unqualified success. Maeve obviously chose not to believe my protestations of innocence, genuine though they were, subjecting me to an uncomfortably close interrogation all the way back to Rickmansworth. By the time we'd slammed the front door shut, I was beginning to feel as though I had perhaps done something that infringed my marriage vows, the Ten Commandments and the Highway Code collectively. The articulation of unfounded suspicion continued for a few days afterwards. And it began to strike me that Maeve, intuitively perhaps, knew more about this non-relationship than I did. This left me thinking. Perhaps destiny was at work here. Perhaps those three unrelated and quite random encounters were more than just coincidental. Perhaps even the green apparel favoured by the lady was a signal, hmm, a signal to go. The prospects were really quite alluring. Throughout our marriage, neither of us had had an affair. Well, I certainly hadn't and I never had any occasion to doubt May's fidelity. To be honest, we spent very little time in each other's company, and then we never talked much about ourselves. We just sort of drifted along. But but now, well, being new to this sort of thing, I wasn't exactly sure how to go about it. Should I plan a campaign? Should I contrive a meeting? How did one arrange these matters? I mean, I wasn't totally naive. I had several mates who'd been divorced, some of them even twice, but listening to them going on about their problems made me wonder if it was worthwhile. Perhaps now was my chance to find out. Obviously, I needed to lurk around Selfridges at lunchtime, but on reflection, I didn't like the idea of lurking. If this was going to be a fairy tale romance, ordained by fate, lurking didn't seem, well, not quite right somehow. I mean, none of the great romantic heroes I'd ever read or heard about didn't need lurking as they caught at their heart's desire. So I decided against that and settled for just another accidental meeting. If she should be coming out of Selfridges while I was walking past, so be it. Wasn't quite sure what to do after that, though. I didn't even know anything about the woman. I might like the way she looked. And the fact that she was on my mind so much must have meant something. But, I mean, suppose I spoke to her and she replied in a Birmingham accent. I'm quite sure if I could cope with that. Suppose she wiped her nose on a green sleeve. I'm, how much of a turn-on would that be? And as I considered some of these less attractive possibilities, I began to wonder if this was a good idea after all. As it happened... I didn't have to wander or agonise very much longer because it was all taken out of my hands before I knew where I was. Fate was taking all the decisions for me. In some ways, it was just the old story again. Only this time, I was leaving the office in Orchard Street while she was coming out of Selfridge's food hall. Once again... I mustered all the sophisticated mating techniques in my armoury and stood and stared at her. Green skirt this time, and at least I had the wit to notice she had legs. This time she caught me looking at her, and she stopped, crossed the road to where I was standing like a lemon, and looked back at me quizzically, head a little to one side, puzzled expression. Excuse me, she said. Haven't I seen you somewhere, just recently? Ha! Huh. My reply was worthy of Casanova himself. You, you don't have a Birmingham accent? And I think the rest of the conversation went something like, Sorry? You don't have a, a Birmingham accent? Well, perhaps that's because I come from St Albans. So, who are you? What's all this about Birmingham? Oh, just a minute. Now I remember. The theatre. The other night. You were in the foyer during the interval. Uh, uh, yes. 
You appear to have upset your wife. Uh, was she your wife? Uh, yes. Did you enjoy the evening? Uh, yes. I, I mean, no. Sorry? Yes. I, I, I mean, no, no. I, 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 I didn't enjoy it. Did your wife? No. I, I, I mean, yes. Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I mean, yes. Thank you. She laughed. She had a nice laugh. She had a nice voice. She was, well, nice. And she held out her hand to say goodbye. That was nice too. When she'd gone, it took me a little while to remember why I'd left the office. Oh, lunch. Yes, that was it, lunch. So I wandered off in what I vaguely hoped was the right direction and thought to myself, well, that was that. If I had any intention of taking this any further, forget it. I exhibited the vocabulary of a hamster. I might even have dribbled. Henceforth, she would look upon me as some sort of pathetic incompetent. Not quite the impression I had hoped to make. Oh, well, probably just as well. I was completely out of my depth. Anyway, what about Maeve? I wasn't supposed to be doing any of this. I was married. Not particularly happily, and in this day and age, nobody seemed to bother very much about that sort of thing. And I I have to say this, it, it did bother me. At least it bothered me until I got home.